So now I'm, I'm going to turn to introducing our next speaker. And we're going across the border to hear from Todd Woodard, who is the Executive Director of Infrastructure and Resources with the Samish Indian Nation. Todd has had a long career in resource management, habitat restoration, and grant administration, mostly with tribal nations in Western Washington. Todd has been involved in many stream and beach restoration projects, as well as being instrumental in the coordination required to strategically implement these projects, which is a role that Eric uh, highlighted as being so central and key to project success. So in Todd's words, he and his staff are tasked with preserving, protecting, and enhancing culturally significant natural resources and habitats within Samish traditional territory for current and future generations. And Todd, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. I squile Sianish Chalicha, Todd Woodard Zenesnat, so Samish Sen, Silent Tixwa, so Shitatanquin Atlan, Kokwasan Wanidam Ken. So good afternoon, honored friends, colleagues, and relations. My name is Todd Woodard, as mentioned before. I work for the Samish Indian Nation, and uh, the long-winded title uh, simply means I get to work with both our natural resources and our planning staffs. And today I'm here uh, specifically representing the house that watches over all the territory, which is the name given to our natural resources department. And then the last thing I said was, uh, I will continue on now in English. Um, Let's see, make sure the clicker's working here. So first things first, um, I did big disclaimer, I am not indigenous to the Salish Sea or to the Anacortes area. Uh, my family hails on my dad's side from uh, England via the Mayflower to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and my mom's side of the family uh, hails from Sweden. So what I'm going to be sharing today is not a true indigenous perspective of these projects, but it's uh, information that Samish citizens and others have shared with me and have authorized me to share more broadly. So just always like to make sure that uh, that's out in the forefront of folks' mind as I'm speaking. And so for folks that may not be uh, super familiar with uh, this little part of the Salish Sea, our headquarters are located in the city of Anacortes, which is where you pick up the ferries to get out to the San Juan Islands on the state side here. So we're truly kind of right in the heart of the Salish Sea. and. Uh, most times when our staff is out working, especially out in the northern and western part of the territory, we can actually see the funny black line in the water that uh, designates uh, switching our cell phones over ca to Canadian service. A little bit about the Samish people. One of the translations of Samish is the giving people. Um, so the people with hundreds of generations of history in this area, just like all Coast Salish folk people in, in the Salish Sea. Uh, with a deep connection to the resources in the Salish Sea, um, rich in Chilangan or, or culture or way of knowing. Um, and I think there's a very common phrase uh, in Coast Salish country that said, when the tide is out, the table is set. And I think that's a really concrete example of how um, intimately connected to the resources in their territories, First Nations and, and tribal communities are. Um, I purposely in this slide chose contemporary pictures with uh, more older uh, historic pictures to try and clearly demonstrate that this culture is rich as rich today as it has been in the past and it continues just as strongly today as it has in the past. Most folks from this area are familiar with our beach types, but just in case there's folks from the East Coast or elsewhere, um, our beaches here are mostly gravel and sand mix beaches. Um, lots of driftwood to provide the armoring and feeder bluffs to provide the finer materials. And our tide range here can be anywhere from a minus three to a plus nine, so quite a, a big range uh, compared to, say, the Gulf of Mexico or, or some other places. Um, and we also have that really odd uh, semi-diurnal diurnal tide cycle. So there's a high high, a high low, a low high, and a low low each day. Um, and this mix of gravel and uh, finer sediments is critical for forage fish habitats such as surf smelt or sand lance and others um, for their spawning activities and, and the base of major food chains that they, they form. Narrowing in now, I'm not going to be speaking nearly on the level of a giant river delta, but a much more local project. So uh, the upper map is a, an area designating Fidalgo Bay, which is within the city limits of Anacortes, and within Fidalgo Bay is Weaverling Spit, and that's the lower picture. And Weaverling Spit is a tribally owned and operated uh, RV uh, park for camping, 
And then the more natural part on the eastern part of that slide um, is actually charged uh, by natural resource for the natural resources department to restore and retain a much more natural setting. It's a very culturally significant place for Samish, and we'll get more into that as I, I delve into the project. The three rectangles uh, of different colors on that slide are going to be the three different phases of the, pro of the beach restoration project that I'm going to be highlighting uh, that occurred between 2009 and 2016. So our project need, um, this entire beach, uh, as indicated in the left picture there, um, was hard armored with riprap. Um, we were having that riprap wall was failing in numerous locations. <clears throat> we were getting lots of erosion events over the entire street stretch of beach over 2,000 feet. Um, in fact, you know, some larger events um, where we get those sustained north winds uh, packing water into this area and high low, you know, low pressures over us and higher tides. We've had five feet of beach loss in, in single events. Um, the water was in, in overtopping uh, the riprap uh, structures in during storm events and infiltrating during those king tides and our beach was deflating so becoming less angled and more flat and becoming coarser so larger uh, material that is not as suitable for the forage fish concerns we were also very concerned because during one of those large storm events uh, this area has some of the oldest shell midden in the state and we were actually finding ancestral remains eroding out of the bank. So that's where Samish's interest uh, for phase one was really peaked. And we also have events uh, in the phase two and phase three areas, such as hosting for the tribal canoe journey that happens each year. Um, and it was getting harder and harder to, uh, to be able to host those events and, and haul those canoes safely um, up the beach and onto the land for the overnight. So then from the natural resources concerns, as mentioned before, um, we have a lot of forage fish spawning. Uh, this is some of the most productive surf smelt spawning area in our part of the state. Um, so just huge spawning events. And if you're, if you're familiar with, for, with surf smelt spawn in particular, this way you could go down and find events where it looked like someone was literally spreading 50 pound bags of cream of wheat all over the beach. The eggs were so thick in some places. Um, also, there's extensive eelgrass beds that support salmon and a myriad of other juvenile fish. And also, um, there's a lot of Dungeness crab and clam resources as first foods that are of concern in this area. So all three of these projects were designed by an organization called Coastal Geologic Services, which in our area is probably one of the preeminent uh, soft shore design or natural beach design restoration uh, firms uh, that you can get a hold of. So we're very, very lucky to be able to bring them on board for these projects. And from the beginning, um, we asked that our elevations be designed with sea level rise projections in mind. And uh, as a spoiler alert, each phase gets higher and higher in elevation as we go over the years. Um, and we knew from the get-go that this, as you can see from that picture in the upper right, that our projections for around 2100 show that the lower part of the park will no longer be sustainable. Um, it was salt marsh prior to being filled in uh, prior, you know, which was a long time before the tribe took possession of it as an RV park. It will be salt marsh again. Um, so we're trying to delay some of the damage while we, uh, while we work through managed retreat planning and, and restoration of the area uh, in the future. So phase one, um, we began in September 3rd of 2009. Um, essentially because of the archeology span concerns, we could only bring material in via one narrow uh, sort of roadways, quote unquote, or pathway that had been uh, deemed clear of, of archeological concerns. And so all of the material had to, be had to be dumped on one piece of beach and then ferried down, um, down the beach. We also found pretty quickly that down beach was very soft. And so you had to use tracked vehicles uh, to be able to bring it down there and kind of build the beach as you went. Um, so it was literally scoop by scoop um, with the excavator. Um, we also placed uh, what we call drift sills, which are, are structures of three large logs, two with the root wads remaining on them. And those were placed perpendicular to the beach um, to help secure the sediment so that the downdrift um, 
activity would not move the material off the beach so quickly. And so those logs were placed uh, anchored to ecology blocks. Um, and uh, we had to have archaeologists on site during all of that excavation as well. Jump slightly ahead to phase two, which uh, occurred in the summer of 2011, and pretty much the same sort of process, um, you know, just, just a repeat of the first. And the reason these were segregated is, is simply because it takes time to secure the amount of funding needed for each of these projects. And so we were able to fund a, a chunk of it, and then we had to go out and uh, beat the pavement and for more funding and, uh, and secure that before we could do phase two. Um, so basically a rinse and repeat of phase one, uh, same drift sills, same method of anchoring them, um, and pretty much the same methods for beach construction. Phase three, we had to jump all the way up into 2016. Um, and this then completed the project, which is, this is the area in front of the RV park sites. This one was quite a bit easier because we could back into each one of the RV park sites. We weren't worried about the archeology span in this area because it was all fill. And so we were able to uh, complete this project far quicker. Um, we only had the main sites, waterfront sites of the park closed for about a week uh, for the entire project here. Uh, so that one went much quicker. And I didn't wanna to focus too much just on the construction process, but here's sort of uh, a summary of costs and the amount of materials that we brought in um, here because of the forage fish concerns. All of our material had to be approved by uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and it had to be what's called the forage fish mix. So it's, you know, four scoops of gravel, two scoops of sand, and three scoops of something else. And then Fish and Wildlife says, okay, that'll work. And then you commission your gravel pits to ma manufacture or, or mix that material for you to bring it in. So in some cases where we had large areas to fill, we were able to use larger material in the base layers and then top it with a, a big chunk of the forage fish mix. Um, and, you know, as you can see, uh, our phase one costs here were quite significant, but you can also see from the before and after pictures that we had quite a bit of material that we had to bring in. Here's our phase two, uh, similar uh, just set of costs and, and materials. Um, the interesting piece here, you can see those planting beds up in the top. Um, those were placed on top of a known archeology span site. So we couldn't dig into the site to plant the plants. So we actually had to make planting berms or mounds uh, to plant our plants and trees in. And we worked with uh, a local Anacortes alternative high school and moved over 60 cubic yards of topsoil by hand, wheelbarrow and shovel. Um, and we had to segregate this material from the natural material using a weed barrier fabric. And um, in working with our Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation in the state, um, I was concerned about that because as we were trying to plant trees, as the roots hit those weed barrier cloths, I was worried that they would just spread out. And in five years, they'd all blow over. So the compromise we came to is I was allowed to cut slits in the fabric in hopes that the roots would uh, find their own way through. Um, and the trees have been, have been successful in, in staying up now. Um, so we're pretty happy that that technique seems to have worked and, and satisfied the requirements of, of the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. And finally, phase three, more riprap removed, more material brought in, um, and costs went ever up. Uh, excuse me, there should, there's a typo there. That should be phase three costs, not phase two costs. Um, and uh, so costs ever went up during the, cost, the, the length of the project and as did our elevations. Now, what I really want to focus on, though, is, um, you know, why and, and what we've learned from this project. Um, from the time we between, between when we finished phase two and before we were able to start phase three, we had a major storm come in during a king tide. Um, and so we had that really big low pressure over us. We had wind from the north uh, packing water into Fidalgo Bay against the site, and we had a king tide. And um, the entire lower park uh, for the Samish uh, RV park flooded, did um, well over $200,000 of damage to our convention and gathering center, uh, and caught, you know, a lot of beach material was thrown directly into the park for a good 50 yards. And so we had a lot of damage and um, uh, 
you know, you could just see somewhat from that right hand picture when the waves were crashing into the riprap, it was just with such energy and such force that it was exploding over the top and had a lot of downward erosion from what energy was reflected downward and then back out uh, as it hit those hard surfaces. Now the picture on the left is all I did was turn 180 degrees to look at our restored beach and the water was gently coming up the beach, the natural beach slope, all of that sand and gravel and, uh, and other natural material was moving and absorbing energy. And we had virtually zero erosion. We had a couple natural storm berms uh, that formed on that beach. So far more successful at weathering the now more frequent storms um, that we're expecting to see uh, due to climate change. Uh, also, the, the surf smelt have been very successful in this area. Surf smelt were literally spawning on the phase, phase one beach the day we pulled the equipment off the beach and sort of cut the ribbon on it. So it's still continuously heavily used there. <laughs> and over the last five, you know, uh, we're showing a lot of increased diversity from uh, our our beach saving activities of just uh, general species of fish, whether it be the variety of sculpins or bay pipe fish or, or what have you uh, in the eelgrass beds. But one thing that we did find was it took almost five years for our newly constructed beach to show the same kind of diversity that we were finding in comparison natural beaches uh, in Fidalgo Bay. So one of the conclusions uh, that we've kind of learned is that, you know, if you're doing effectiveness monitoring on a project like this from a fish perspective, you might need to plan to wait a little bit longer than you might think in order to see that diversity come back. The other thing that's been really exciting about this project is because it's so accessible, um, we've been working with a lot of partners uh, that are working with communities that want to remove their hardshore seawall or riprap um, and are considering doing a more natural living shoreline type approach. We're able to bring them to the beach and we can talk to them about our success and, and any challenges that we had and sort of uh, help sell this type of activity over reinforcing their seawall or, or their riprap activity. So that's been a real good bonus of being a, a real accessible project. So what's next for us? Um, this project was done with some climate change in mind, but was before we had, you know, a full scale climate resiliency effort uh, at Samish uh, Indian Nation. And so now that we have a climate adaptation specialist position and, and some climate uh, expertise in our planning departments, we're actually looking um, at some sort of managed retreat uh, process for this, uh, this location. We know we're not going to be able to hold the sea back forever here. And so it's more about what can we do and what do we need to be thinking about as we move away from this area. And so, you know, for instance, having a, a plan for all of the sewer, electrical, uh, cable infrastructure that's at every one of these sites, uh, we wouldn't want to just leave that in place and walk away. So we'd want to be doing some type of activity that would uh, restore this area. Um, the other piece that we're looking at on phase two, where there's a nice big open field behind it, is um, how can we plan for the beach to migrate and uh, still provide viable uh, habitat for clams and, and, and forage fish and other things important to the nation. So that's kind of where we're starting to focus our efforts now on sort of the concrete uh, planning phase uh, for this location overall. Um, and uh, I'm going to be way under time, so I think I'll help gain some time back for folks. Uh, this is our Samish DNR crew, a um, bunch of passionate folks that, as were mentioned, were char are charged with uh, protecting, enhancing, and restoring all culturally relevant species and their habitats for current and future generations. Uh, we do a wide variety of science and restoration work, um, and I'm really happy that we were able to share one of our projects with you today. And with that, I will take a pause and we can do questions. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Todd. Uh, really appreciate your uh, taking the time and the presentation. Um, before I go to a question, I, I just, um, something near the end of your presentation there really uh, stood out to me in that, that uh, um, uh, graphic of the sea level rise and your, uh, I think you characterize it uh, looking at sort of an eventuality of a, a, a managed retreat. And 
I mean, it just really highlights the, the, um, you know, the circumstance that we're, we're facing that, um, you know, to, despite best efforts to do what we can under the current conditions, that it really is a, a, a changing world. And, and, and that's a, a fairly drastic kind of, uh, to get over to that, that idea that that might be reality is, is uh, I don't think, something that a lot of people want to even admit or talk about. And, and so to see it sort of presented in there, I, I just thought that was, uh, um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, what Thank it took to, to put something yeah, like that uh, in a presentation and speak about it, that's, that's quite powerful. I will say that the first conversations around the realities of what's going to happen there were, were not very well received by tribal council. Um, but, um, you know, as you, as you bring forth and, and the support that they've given us for our climate resiliency efforts, um, you know, we have an opportunity to develop the educational materials for our citizens and our council members so that they, they do understand. And, um, I, I will say they're, they're definitely, um, concerned. I think, you know, there are tribes out on the Washington coast that are, are literally doing land exchanges with federal entities and relocating their entire village because they know that their current site is not going to be there. And this is a place that they've inhabited for millennia. Um, so yeah, it is, it is drastic. Um, and I think indigenous communities, um, at least, you know, everywhere, but, you know, here in the States where there are only particular beaches that certain tribes can say, go harvest clams for a, a ceremony or a first food. If those beaches disappear, um, it becomes really difficult to sustain that cultural activity. Yeah. Yeah. And especially as you say, in a context of people that have been connected to that land for millennia, uh, facing that kind of a, a challenge. Um, so, uh, so thanks very much again, and I'll maybe uh, look to the, the one question we have there in the Slido um, that's got a bunch of thumbs up um, and uh, asking about surf smelt and uh, um, what experience you might have with the, the, you know, loss or disappearance of surf smelt from areas they, they've been plentiful. Um, if you have any information more that you can share with us on that. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of work in uh, the southern part of the Salish Sea here around uh, around forage fish, especially surf smelt, because it's you know it's relatively easy to survey for the smelt eggs and stuff, and um, absolutely seeing it decline over time, and and a lot of it seems to be linked towards a uh, the reduction of sh over over shading vegetation that keeps the be the eggs cool. And B, the fact that we've sort of cut off most of our natural sediment supplies through infrastructure so that those beaches are flattening and coarsening so they're susceptible to higher wave energy and there's just not the right size material that surf smelt are looking for uh, to secure their eggs to. Um, so I think it's, it's um, you know, a combination of things. There's certainly also concern around ocean acidification and, and sea temperature rise uh, that are, are no doubt playing an impact as well. But we are seeing declines. Um, that's one of the reasons that this particular beach project was important, not only to secure the cultural concerns, but also because it is such a productive uh, surf smelt uh, spawning area and, and the recognition that those forage fish are so critical to our salmon life cycles and therefore our orca uh, life cycles and, and cultural uh, connections of, of indigenous people. So. I should actually also mention that I forgot to, that um, this was the first project in the state that was partially, phase one was the first project in the state that was partially funded by the State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. And the reason they kicked, they kicked some funding towards it was to have a place where we could try and determine whether soft shore or more natural restoration techniques um, can help uh, protect these types of areas as well or better than hard armoring. So it's been a, a pretty neat uh, pilot project in that respect as well. All right, well, thanks for that one, Todd. Uh, I'll go to the next one in our Slido queue here. It's from Sarah and asking, what was the rationale for the weed barrier fabric? Was it to prevent cultural findings from migrating to the surface? Um, the way it was portrayed to me, what it was simply so that if there was ever archeology span done there in the future, they would know that there was some sort of demarcation between what was natural and what we did, and they could tell where that was. Um, 
had some pretty serious conversations with the departments. They were mandating this. And, you know, I, I was ma making the case that we can't really do restoration plantings if the roots can't, you know, naturally get into the soil and, and secure themselves. So there was quite a bit of conversations about, you know, what do we do when, you know, sort of the rules around cultural protection, cultural um, site protection conflict a little bit with restoration. Um, and so that's that's where the compromise um, was in place. It was a bit of an experiment. I was, I, I'll be honest, I was not convinced that those trees would naturally find their way through that fabric, but they appear to have done so. So, um, so we're pretty happy with the results, but that, that was why it, we needed to demarcate our modern uh, activity from what was there in the past. Well, thanks for that, Todd. Uh, Byron, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, sure. The, um, uh, looking at a couple of the questions there, there's two of them that seem fairly similar and it, it more of an opportunity, Todd, for you to speak about um, potentially other restoration works or climate adaptation works that the Savish are working on. Um, okay. So uh, we do have a bit of extra time. So if there were things that you, you didn't include in your original presentation because of the time constraints and uh, would like to speak about those maybe um, pass that to you. If not, we can uh, sure. um, go into another question. No, I, I, and, and somebody pulled a hook out because there's so many different projects <laughs> that Samish, you know, the 10 members of Samish DNR are working on that I'm sure I could uh, take all that time and more. But um, we've done a lot of uh, river restoration work and riparian zone restoration work for, um, you know, both for natural riverine processes and, and for salmon restoration. But we've also worked on endangered Oregon spotted frog restoration in wetlands that's you know connected to salmon or you know connected to cultural use materials for weaving or what have you. Um, so Samish DNR tends to look at uh, our projects a little bit holistically, and and it's not just about salmon or just about clams or just about something else. It's 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 always got that cultural link um, to what we're doing, um, but it, it tends to look sort of system wide. Um, but we also have had a long running project of marine debris removal from the beaches throughout the San Juan archipelago, where we've removed well over a million pounds of creosote and a diffuse creosote and other marine debris off the beaches in an effort to reduce toxins to the environment. Um, we've started a scientific dive team. So we've got AAUS certified divers that are doing research on kelp uh, in the San Juans. And so we're starting to work very closely with the state um, and Canadian partners um, around what's happening to our kelp forests and what can we be doing about it. Um, I'm a member of the steering committee for the BioActNet or Biodiversity Action Network, um, which is a joint Washington, BC effort that's couched in the UN's uh, Ocean Decade Declaration. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of work um, around kelp right now. And, and it looks like in a couple of years, we may be doing potential outplanting at pilot sites in the San Juans to see about actually putting restoration under the water uh, as well as on the ground. Um, we also work very closely with the city of Anacortes on stormwater monitoring and other water quality concerns. Um, yeah, and I, I know I'm missing half. So my staff that are probably watching this presentation are gonna hammer me at the end of this, but it's um, because of that mission statement that we mentioned, it's, it's just, it ends up being really broad but the key is there's always that connection to how can we um, ensure that cultural activities and cultural ideals um, can continue, you know, for the next seven generations and beyond. Great, thanks. And I'm going to look to another uh, uh, question there in the Slido that came up. And I, I recall in one of the early um, the sessions this morning, um, thinking about asking around uh, the importance of, of riparian or, or shoreline vegetation in the, that nearshore marine context. And uh, I know you mentioned in your, your uh, answer to a previous question around surf smelt that that was one of, you felt that was one of the, the key things that shade and overhanging vegetation. And um, there's another question here about, uh, you know, general lack of uh, riparian vegetation along the shorelines and, um, you know, uh, have you had any experience in that kind of work? Uh, Ray vegetated shorelines are, are most exposed. And if you can speak a little bit to yeah, that, maybe, 
I was going to say maybe sure. that's, that's a good one for the panel later, but uh, but uh, uh, thought I'd uh, push that one to you first, just since uh, you brought it up around surf smelt. Sure, it's absolutely something we ran into on all all three of these phases of this project. So. Um, phase one, um, I neglected to mention, is actually on private property. There's a, a condo uh, complex that was built there, and that was actually part of the problem. The developer, you know, stripped all the shoreline vegetation to get that ocean view for, for the condo folks. And so we had to work with them on what can we plant here to have both for root mass to secure the beach and potential shade for surf smelt. And we had to make some compromises because they didn't want big trees that would block their view. Um, so we ended up settling on things that were a little bit uh, lower. We're lucky in the fact that their first floor is a parking garage, so we could go a little bit higher. Um, but then the honest truth is their landscaping folks uh, look at it as a hedge. And, and oftentimes we come back and sort of the roses are all, you know, hedged out at three feet. Um, so we're getting a mix, you know, we're getting really good root, con root mass there, but not as much shade as we had hoped. Um, Phase two was across that field, and we are getting overarching shade from some of the taller trees that we planted in those planting berms. But there again was a case where we couldn't sort of sew up the beach with vegetation to make it a, a really natural shoreline because we need that space uh, to host cultural events like Canoe Journey. And so we created walkways between our planting berms so that there were passages to bring the canoes up into the field. And that field is utilized for camping uh, when those canoe families and their support crews are, are, are visiting Samish territory. And then the RV park, you know, they charge a premium for those waterfront sites. So we've toy we've worked with a few trying to plant trees in strategic places. Um, usually that fosters immediate complaints from the RV park guests. Um, and so we're toying with ideas of, you know, is there a way that we could dig a bigger hole and put some soil in and plant a taller tree so that we could, you know, limb it up and it becomes a place to sit in the shade, but doesn't, you know, obstruct the view. It, it, it's difficult in that situation. People aren't patient uh, to have those trees grow up to the point where we can, uh, we can limb them up and, and have both viewscape and shade. So it is absolutely a challenge. Um, and there's other restoration projects in Fidalgo Bay that are facing the same challenge. Um, where vegetation can't be placed, um, but there is survivability there. It's just not as robust as it could be. Great. Uh, oh, sorry, Jason. Nope. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, thanks for that, Todd. I think I might just go to one more question because uh, it'll give me a chance to give the other panel members a heads up that we'll be coming to them shortly. Sure. And uh, I'll, I'll maybe just uh, use the democracy of the top one in the uh, Slido, but it it's a, maybe a little bit bigger scope than what we asked you before about other restoration projects. But you know, part of the, the exchange here is to uh, learn about all the different dimensions of things that, that entities that we don't work with every day might be involved in. So is there anything that you'd like to share in terms of what Samish is doing around climate adaptation, maybe perhaps more broadly than what you've spoken to already? Sure, absolutely, and and I'll I'll give a brief overview. But if folks are interested, if you Google Samish Indian Nation, you know find find the tribe on the website, and go to the Natural Resources Department. There's a whole slew of um, of our climate adaptation work that you can link to. It started with um, a vulnerability assessment that was completed about four or five years ago, um, and we really wanted that vulnerability assessment to be driven by tribal citizens. So we really tried to reach out and say, hey, what are your concerns about climate change? And normally that was met with, I don't know, what should we be concerned about? So we had to develop a lot of education materials. But in the end, our vulnerability assessment is essentially written by the Samish citizens. So for example, more than 200 plant and animal species were identified as species of concern by Samish citizens that we then did individual vulnerability assessments on those materials. Um, and from that, we were able to determine certain habitats that maybe how, you know, host um, a number of those species that we could focus our efforts on. And um, from that work, um, we've also done a sea level rise vulnerability assessment. We've done work where we surveyed uh, public and quasi public lands um, and looked at their plant community from that cultural lens. So not so much, you know, what trees should be here, but what cultural use trees and plants should be here or first medicinal plants or first food plants should be here or are here. And then we've been able to work with those land managers 
to say, hey, these are plants that you might not really think about in your vegetation management plan, but they're important to Coast Salish people. And the more refugia that we can have of these, the better chance that they may be accessible in the, in the face of climate change. Um, and we've also then been able to work with them as you're in your vegetation management plan. If you're looking at restoration, hey, these are some things you might want to consider adding to the mix. Uh, and we've done that with uh, national parks and, and several other entities and throughout this, our, uh, our territory. Um, most recently, our main focus is the um, U.S. has just released what's called a collu uh, pol climate pollution reduction uh, grant. And it's, it's part of the large amount of funding that's coming towards climate change resiliency through the Biden administration. And it's a certain amount of steps we have to go through to create a certain report that will then allow us to apply for our share of several, you know, many billions of dollars worth of implementation dollars. So um, we're working through our emissions inventory there and identifying projects. Um, we've placed solar on two different locations, and I currently have grant applications out to outfit our entire uh, 14 cottage unit elders housing program with solar as well as our other administrative buildings. So um, we're very active in looking at alternative energy and reducing the tribe's greenhouse gas footprint. We've got you know our, our local fleet of vehicles, our electric. Um, we were one of the first tribes to sign on to the we're still in movement, which was a commitment to the Paris Accord um, when the prior administration pulled out of that. Um, so our tribe you know, and council have been very, very supportive and, and very engaged with what can we be doing um, to make sure that we're not just, you know, complaining about the impacts, but we're doing something to help mitigate for it. Well, that's that's a nice uh, maybe um, ending of that kind of bigger picture, uh, um, in what's beyond restoration, but still connects to it in a nice way to uh, and turn over now to our panel.